today it's all trying to understand the science behind what might be going on. Okay? So we're going to look at the importance of the sarcoplasm for muscle function. And we're going to look at what sarcoplasmic hypertrophy actually is. So we are going to define today, uh, so by the end of the lecture you will know what sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is. And hopefully if you ever encounter some misconceptions or some information which is not linking with this, it will enable you to question what, what's happening. Um, and then we're going to look at the scientific models that explain why sarcoplasmic hypertrophy occurs. So we need to define, like we did in the previous uh, presentation, what myofibril or myofibrillar hypertrophy is. We need to define what sarcoplasm is. So it's the water-filled space that contains the myofibrillar content, which is the grey um, shaded circles that we've already talked about. And remember, I planted that seed in your mind in the first part of the lecture with the pink area. Uh, and then when we look at this magnified up, we can see all of the little myofibrils and myofilaments, but then the pink area here is the um, water-filled part of the, the, the muscle cell, okay? So it contains non-myofibrillar components as well. So what are they? They are the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which contains uh, calcium, which is important for enabling cross-bridge formation and getting a muscle contraction. We've got ribosomes, which are very important in <laughs> protein synthesis. Um, we've also got glycolysis enzymes as well, um, so lots of these particles are circulating here. Mitochondria are circulating in the sarcoplasm as well. So basically all of the cell contents that you would have in, a, in your normal cell are also present in the water part of the, the muscle fibre. So that's what the sarcoplasm is. Now, the, the water, the fluid, helps to maintain a pH within the muscle. We need to make sure that the pH is not uh, too acidic or too alkaline because we want the enzymes within the muscle to be working correctly. And we know that the en enzymes have a very uh, optimum window of, uh, uh, for the pH. So they help to maintain the pH. They also help to maintain ionic balance between what's surrounding the outside of the muscle in the extra extracellular fluid and what is within the intracellular fluid. So different ions, sodium, potassium, etc. Um, it helps to ensure that there's an equal proportion of the right ions in the right place. And they've also got sarcoplasmic proteins that are important for muscle function. And an example of that is the, the uh, ribosomes here, which are important for muscle function. Okay? So that's what the sarcoplasm is. So what is sarcoplasmic hypertrophy? Now, before we answer that question, we just need to re remind ourselves of the definition for myofibrillar hypertrophy. So myofibrillar hypertrophy is the growth of the myofibrils in size and number. And as they grow, the sarcoplasm kind of expands with them at the same time. Because remember when I said that when these grow, they push on the sarcolemma, that they make that sarcoplasm area greater. We get the increase in cross-sectional area. However, uh, and, and this is what we can see here. So in this d diagram here, we can see that process happening. It's making the muscle fiber larger. However, with sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, the sarcoplasm expands by a greater amount than the increase in myofibrillar size. So the best illustration is in this diagram here. We can see that the water part is greater. And now when you compare where you've got lots of myofibrillar bundles contained within this uh, myofibrillar hypertrophy muscle, uh, in sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, it's actually the water part which expands at a greater rate than the myofibrillar protein content. Okay, so um, we, we get an increase in water within the muscle. So now all of a sudden those myofibrils are kind of like spaced out a little bit more. They've got more fluid around them. And, and again, it's a 30% increase in cell size. Um, and it's main, mainly due to the increase in water content within the muscle that happens with, with training. And again, these figure, this figure in particular is adapted from the Roberts paper, which goes into great detail about um, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. So again, it's well worth a read. And this figure here just illustrates that difference between an increase in water and an increase in protein content. This is growth of new myofibrils, more protein within the muscle. This is the accumulation of water in the muscle cell. Now, in the past, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy was often attributed to having this kind of pumped physique, this pumped state that you often see bodybuilders having. So here, this picture I've taken, I really carefully try to look on Google Images to find the right picture to illustrate the point that I want to make. So um, what you've actually got 
uh, towards this side of the screen is, and if I just use my arrows, so you've got an individual who uh, has quite large muscles, um, and you, it, it, it's very likely this individual is also having sarcoplasmic hypertrophy going on, so he's got a very pumped look. Now, as we get towards here, we've got much more uh, what we call thinner athletes, but they've still got muscle and they produce more strength than the bodybuilder. So although their muscle mass is smaller, they're able to, ha they, they have myofibrillar hypertrophy. And if you go to Carnarvon and Brailsford, you go to Platform 81, and you see a lot of the Olympic weightlifters and powerlifters, they're not big, bulky, uh, you know, this type of guy. They're quite slim, they're very flexible, Obviously, they, they're able to produce force quite quickly, um, so they're not necessarily big. They're more uh, aligned to these two individuals here. So, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy might explain the kind of pump that bodybuilders have, and it's to make their muscles accentuated. And remember, there is a difference between the sports. So, bodybuilders or bodybuilding is a very aesthetic sport. It's a, it involves a lot of skill, it involves a lot of practice, but you're going onto a stage and you, you need to aesthetically, aesthetically look good and impress the judges. Olympic weightlifting or powerlifting as well, both obviously are two different dif disciplines, but they involve uh, strength and, uh, and quick force application. They are not obviously aesthetic sports, they're all based on actual um, producing force and strength. Okay, you're actually trying to lift the bar, and if you can lift the bar with the greatest amount of weight, um, then obviously you're going to be winning the medal. So th there's a very there's a big difference in in the two sports. However, it's very important that although the bodybuilder physique has thought to be due to sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, and especially at the point of competition when uh, bodybuilders are actually competing, they probably don't have as much strength as the powerlifting guy. But what's actually important, so although they have less functional strength at the point of competition, strength we know is de dependent on neuromuscular adaptations. So what I'm trying to say here is that if a bodybuilder um, wants to do resistance training which is geared towards increased weights or load that they're lifting so they do more Olympic weightlifting or powerlifting type training there is no reason why they can't be as strong as this guy so what, what, what I'm trying to say here is that the training determines what type of uh, uh, hypertrophy you're actually going to get and so a bodybuilder may need to have sarcoplasmic hypertrophy in order to have uh, pumped up muscles look good for competition but that's not to say that that bodybuilder could not be as strong as a power lifter you know it just depends on what training you're exposing your body to so now some people say that sarcoplasmic hypertrophy doesn't even exist they say it's bullshit you know you just get my fibula hypertrophy there's no sarcoplasmic hypertrophy get out of here so you've got to look at the scientific literature and say okay what is the evidence for sarcoplasmic is there any evidence and the first study, I've got it here, was actually published in 1892 by a gentleman called Moore Pergo. Uh, yeah, I pronounced that right. So I've got that in the notes section here, 1892. And he showed in animals that fibre size uh, was able to increase due to non... or the muscle was able to increase due to non-myofibrillar contents. Okay, so Moore Pergo, back in 1897, more than 100 years ago, was able to show in animals that if there was an increase in the muscle cross-sectional area, it was, some of it was down to non-myofibrillar content within the muscle. Then came along uh, the, the first human studies in 1982 by McDougall and colleagues, and they took five untrained subjects, and they did an upper arm resistance training for six months. They obtained muscle biopsies. Now, muscle biopsies is one of the truest ways to understand what's happening in the muscle. And, you know, basically, they, they take a chunk out of your muscle. They put a biopsy needle in and extract a chunk of your muscle, um, and, and they're able to then analyse the contents of the, the muscle cells. So they obtained these in the triceps muscle before they underwent the intervention and again afterwards. And what they showed was that there was a 3% decrease in the space occupied by the myofibrils, but a 15% increase in space occupied by the sarcoplasm. So the sarcoplasm had expanded, and the space where the myofibrils reside had reduced. And then there was a lot of other intervention studies that reported very similar findings after doing very high volume, uh, so many sessions, resistance training. So there was evidence that sarcoplasmic hypertrophy was occurring. So that this was experimental evidence in humans. 
Then there was the single muscle fibre study by Mayer and colleagues in 2015, so a little bit more recent, and they were able to show that bodybuilders had a larger cross-sectional area, but lower force production when compared to power athletes. So we look back to the previous slide, that's what I was alluding to, but not what I concluded. I concluded that bodybuilders can be as strong as power athletes. Now, we have to take this study, this study has been discussed quite a lot um, online and, and, and people have tried to understand about the relevance of these findings because they're quite big figures here, lower force production by 66%, so that's quite a large amount. But the, the, there are some limitations to the study. First of all, the findings are likely because the power athletes had very high myofibrillar density from the type of training they were doing, so you know their starting point was a lot higher as well. But they also had a very small sample size, they didn't have follow-up assessments, um, and also they were looking at muscle um, cross-sectional area, or they were looking at characteristics of a single muscle fibre. And again, this is a technique which I've put the link to an experimental video methods article in the notes section of the slide. But a single fibre force is not going to be applicable to what's happening in the whole muscle. So when we've got millions of myofilaments making up the whole muscle, taking a single fibre and looking at how it contracts and how much force it produces is not representative of the whole muscle. Therefore, pinch of salt needed. So you've got to take these find the, the findings by Mayer at all with a pinch of salt. It's not to say that they're not relevant, but we don't have enough long-term studies to really know what, what's actually happening. So in truth, at the point of competition, bodybuilders probably do have sarcoplasmic hypertrophy and less force production compared to powerlifters and Olympic weightlifters, but if they were to do the right training, they can develop that same force to Olympic weightlifters and powerlifters as well. So um, it just depends what you're training the muscle for.